19, 2001, at about 3 a.m., found me in my mom's house in the guest bedroom, masturbating and trying to get to sleep. <laughs> because sometimes you just need to get to sleep. About a month earlier, I was at my brand new job, and I got a phone call. I'd been at this job for maybe six weeks, and my stepdad, who I never talked to, called me. And I thought, why is he calling me? This can't be good. You've gotten that call, right, where yeah. it's, the, it's middle of the day, someone who never calls you calls you, and that sinking of dread in the pit of your stomach. And so I excuse myself to one of the conference rooms, and he tells me, your mom's in the hospital. That multiple sclerosis we thought she had is brain cancer. And we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know, we don't know anything. All we know is that she's in the ER, and they took one look at her eye bulging out of her head and said she has a tumor and we're going to see if we can get it out. They, quit, they ran tests and over the next few weeks we found out that it was a rare form of a rare cancer that generally presents in children. For the medical students in the room, Ewing sarcoma presenting right behind the eye. And that even if they had diagnosed it six months ago when she first started having headaches, it would have done no good at all. And so in the middle of December, I flew home to watch my mom die. And that morning, December 19th, I was laying in bed desperately trying to get to sleep. My dog was in the crate next to the bed. And do you ever have that feeling that someone's in the room with you? That sudden, like, who's there? The door doesn't open, but just something is with you. I stop what I'm doing. I open my eyes, I look around. Even the dog felt it, like the dog at the bottom of the bed was like, shaky, shaky, shake. But nothing's in the room. Okay. So a few minutes later, I fall asleep. And the next morning at 7.55, my alarm that morning is not for my phone, but for my stepdad, who hammers, hammers, hammers on the door and says she's gone and he walks away, leading a trail of sobs behind him. And immediately, because this is what I do in tragedy, immediately I go into type A mode. And I tug on my clothes. Uh, I think the dog stayed in her crate, poor dog. And I immediately start saying, okay, have you called the hospice? No. Have you called the body donation people because she wanted her body donated to the medical school? No. Okay, have you done anything? No. And I said, don't worry, I'm here, I know how to do this. Because that's what my brain does. When my brain has grief and tragedy, it says, I'm not going to deal with that. And instead, it immediately goes to the to-do list. And so I call the hospice nurse. I call the body donation people. And one after the other, they come. They declare time of death. They take all the narcotics away. They take all the narcotics away. The body donation people, the most compassionate people I have ever dealt with in my entire life, they come, they check my paperwork, they make sure that both my stepdad and I are on board for this donation, and then they give us our time to say goodbye. And once we have that time to say goodbye, they bring in the stretcher and they place her on it. And he turns to me and he says, I know, you seem like a very private person. Do you mind if we cover her face? And I say, oh, I mean, of course, yeah, that's fine. I would find out later that many people, when they're in that situation, freak out and they're like, no, no, she can't breathe, she can't breathe, you have to uncover her face. But that's not my way of grief. And so they wheel her out and the hospice workers come through and they take down the hospital bed and they wheel out the oxygen. And that afternoon, my stepdad and I are sitting in the living room that has been newly restored to not have a hospital bed in it. 
and we're sitting there in our numb grief. And he says, she left last night. And I figured that when he said that, that what he meant was that she had died last night and he had woken up in the morning and discovered that she had died. And so I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I was sleeping out here last night where he always slept with her. And in the wee hours of the morning, he opened his eyes because he smelled something, he smelled her. And he felt a cold breeze across his body. And he felt her hair slip across his face. And he knew in that instant that she was going to him and saying goodbye. And I realized that at about the same time in those wee hours of the morning, she came to say goodbye to me too. And I don't know if there's an afterlife. I don't know if the soul is real. I don't know if there's a God or a heaven or a hell. But I do know in that moment that my mom said goodbye to us. And so every December 19th, I may remember her death, but I also remember her love. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you.